Got it. Okay. Very good. All right. And let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the day that we've had, whether it's been meetings or planning or quiet time or um, time uh, in conversation with peers or with students. We bring all of that to you. We bring our hopes. We bring what's exciting about this time, but we also bring our anxieties, perhaps our worries. We bring to you our students who may be struggling, who may be alone, who may be feeling a sense of loss and whatever their issues, their blessings, their blights, their joys, we bring those to you today. We pray that this would be uh, actually a Zoom call that's energizing rather than soul sucking. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide our conversation, that you help us to continue to serve those that you've entrusted to us. We're so grateful for this opportunity. We're so grateful to do work that matters for your kingdom, for your church. And we pray this in Jesus name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. I'm Mike St. Pierre, uh, Executive Director of CCMA. If I haven't had the, the privilege and pleasure of meeting you in person, uh, but at least we see one another once a week. Uh, and I have a couple of announcements to go over, and then uh, we will make sure we get to know each other a little bit better. While I'm going over these announcements, I'm going to break a little bit of a cardinal rule here because we really encourage you not to multitask. However, uh, I do want to invite you in the chat to, uh, instead of this week saying which college you're from, which is something that we usually do, why don't you put into the chat the mascot of your particular college? So uh, we've got some doozies out there. Uh, so don't be bashful. Just put into the chat there what your mascot is for your particular university, and we'll get a little little flavor, a little feel, and then we'll get into our announcements. Oh my goodness, the Bisons, the Bulldogs, the Terps, Clemson Tigers, they have a good football team. Oh my goodness, the Cougars, the Duke, the Wolverines, the Presidents, that's different, the Pirates, Herky the Hawkeye, okay? Houston Cougars, the Thundering Herd, the Seahawks, the Greyhounds. I love this, okay, very good. Wow, okay, Bernie the St. Bernard. That sounds like Siena College in upstate New York. Okay, wonderful. Our mascot is named Merv, the Merv Griffin. Okay, I like that. The Eagles, Catholic Terps, of course, right? The Friars, sounds like Providence College is in the house. The Hornets, Cougars, and Broncos, three schools represented. Lisa, you have a lot on your plate. The Cardinals. Okay, well, great. The Eagles, Zippy, the Vikings, the Yellow Jackets. Oh my goodness. Okay. You have to laugh a little bit on a Wednesday, you know? So, so there you go. All right. Let me share my screen. We'll go over our announcements for today. Sometimes I forget that there's, there's typically over a hundred of us on this uh, because that's, that's a little bit daunting. All right. So hopefully you can see the screen here. Um, let's see. Can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see where it says office hours? Okay, great. So Again, this is just very brief. This is just meant to essentially uh, orient all of us for our conversation today. Give us a little bit of context. If this is your first time or if you've been with us for office hours in the past, very simply put, we want to share best practices. Um, I really believe that the community of Catholic Campus Ministry, almost all, maybe all of the answers we're looking for are within our community. And so by sharing what's working and sometimes what's not, um, that's a tremendous way of learning. We also want to encourage each other. This is obviously a time of a lot of anxiety and a tremendous level of uncertainty in our church, uh, economically, financially, and, and ministerially. I think a lot of us are still wondering what in the world is normal going to look like when COVID-19 kind of subsides, and we just don't have the answers yet. And then we also want to promote peer-to-peer -peer communication. Certainly during these calls, I really encourage you to be sending one another direct messages in the chat or sending everyone messages, um, but that's really valuable. And then in between these sessions, these office hours, I would really encourage you um, to be in touch with one another as well. Today, since we have so many of us, uh, we're going to try something a little bit different, and that's if you want to jump in, we'll invite you to do the raise hand feature. It's at the bottom bar of Zoom, and if you're not sure how to, to do that, it's really pretty straightforward. But we'll, we'll have this as interactive as possible, and we'll make sure that there's plenty of opportunities for people to speak to one another and, and ask questions, that sort of thing. Please try Okay, please try to give your full attention. I know the temptation is to check email or to 
I don't know, play Angry Birds on your phone or, or whatever, right? Or download your newest Zoom virtual background. I'm guilty of that as well. But please try to give your full attention to one another. Don't, don't think of it to me. I, I, don't worry about me, but to one another, because I think we're, we're better learners when we can give our full attention to one another. And the last thing, take a good break after this call. These are energy inducing calls um, and they can be very draining. So make sure you take a good break after today's call. Um, I wanna mention to you, we have two brand new resources from CCMA. One is called Remote Work 101 and then the other one is Remote Work 201. These are slide decks over on the CCMA channel on YouTube. Please check them out. They're five, seven minutes each. 101 shows you the tools that CCMA uses to uh, work collaboratively from a remote setting from three different states. And then Remote Work 201 shows you the advantages of working remotely. It's a whole different way of working as opposed to just trying to replicate what we do on campus. I also wanna encourage you, if you haven't joined the CCMA Facebook group, please do. There's no charge and we'd love to interact with you there. A couple of upcoming events. Next week's office hours is the last one in this particular set. So we do four weeks on one week off just to give everybody a little bit of a breather. And next week is really a good one. We have Angel Hall and Courtney Hall, two really, really talented campus, campus ministers. They're gonna be talking about the value of professional certification. And originally when we had designed this particular office hours for next week, we just thought, there's a lot of interest right now in professional certification. Uh, there's a new process called Pathways, and we're really excited to be taking the curtains back on that and sharing more of that with you. But I'll also say that we have, I don't think we have more time. I mean, I don't know anybody who's just like sitting around twiddling their thumbs. But what we do have is we have more urgency. Um, as dioceses are cutting budgets, as universities are furloughing employees, there's actually no better time than right now to sturdy up our foundation professionally. And I really think certification is one of the ways we can do that. So that's next week. Uh, a little bit sooner, tomorrow at 2 p.m., we'll have Father Peter Martyr and myself. Father Peter is the director of Providence College. And uh, that'll be 2 o'clock Eastern time on Facebook Live where we will be talking about how Providence College and their campus ministry program has made some pretty dramatic quick, quick pivots during COVID-19. So I think you're really gonna enjoy that. I see Father Peter's on the call now. I don't know if you've ever been a Facebook Live Father, but you're gonna do a great job. And that's tomorrow, two o'clock Eastern time. So we'd love to see you bring your questions. It's, it's a lot of fun. And then the last thing I'll mention is May 26th and 27th is the Online Ministry Summit. Guys, this is not your typical online event where 20,000 people sign up for free and then just a few thousand show up for the real thing. This is a simple, intentional, focused opportunity to put a ribbon on the year that we've all managed to, to get through hasn't been easy, and this is gonna be an awesome opportunity. We have speakers like Andrew Robeson, Rosie Shaver, Curtis Martin from Focus, Katie Prejean McGrady, she'll be talking about mental health, um, Father Josh Johnson from the Ask Father Josh podcast. It's gonna be good, it really is, and I think you'll really enjoy it. That's over at ccmnetwork.org. Just go under the resources tab, you can register right there, or online-ministry-summit. As always, if we can help you in any way, uh, you know that uh, myself is on, I'm myself is on the call. I'm on the call, obviously, but Andrea on the CCMA team is on the call. I believe Michelle is on the call, and we're here to essentially make your life just hopefully a little bit easier, a little less stress. So, with that said, we're going to talk today about this whole process of how do we assess this year that we've just had. Oh my goodness, it's been a doozy. And I have a couple of questions I'd like to start us with. Okay. So, all right. The first, the first one is if I would invite you to put into the chat and we'll set up a couple of polls also during this, so you can participate in that way. But in the chat, what have you been measuring? Let's say this were a normal year. Let's say it was just first semester. What kinds of things would you measure regularly? That could be weekly, that could be monthly or, or by quarter or semester. Um, what kinds of things would you be measuring? So I'm going to just ask you to, first of all, put that in the chat, and then we'll get a few of you to, to speak up on that. What kinds of things? Okay, so attendance at everything, mass and activity attendance, participation. Be as specific as you want to be.
Number of new people coming, interesting. Retention rates, that's interesting. Retreat evaluations. Who comes to what? So again, in kind of a normal year, what kinds of things would you be measuring? Service immersion and evaluations. Good, so a lot of similarities and some that are really, really unique. Financial support, small group participation, number of new people who hang around, that's really interesting. Students' interest and feedback from different programs, new leaders, certainly RCAA participation, catechumens candidates, volunteer service participation. Okay, a lot here. So let me ask a couple of you, uh, we'll take you off mute, and I'm just going to put a couple of you on the spot here in terms of uh, just to talk about that. So uh, Steve Zalatik, can I start with you from Lewis University? And uh, just take, go ahead and take yourself off mute there. Why don't you just introduce, just tell us a little bit about Lewis and what kinds of things were you measuring? And then how has that changed as you're finishing up the second semester? Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, we've been collecting data for about 30 years now. Um, we kind of loaded in all our data. So we look at, you know, everyone that's participating, what's their level of participation, so how many different programs, who's new to programs, do they stay after kind of that initial uh, program. And then we've started to do, um, for the last year or two, surveys, you know, so spiritually, how did this affect me? And then trying to you know, respond to those needs. Um, since since COVID-19, I mean, everything's gone online, like I think a lot of people. Um, and so we're kind of trying to adjust to that. Um, shocker here, uh, I'm sorry, my position was just eliminated. So we're really trying to respond to, they're trying to respond to, to that as well. So, um, but doing some good things, Taizé Music Online and trying to look at engagements and, and things like that. I don't know what to say. Thank you, Steve, okay. for sharing that. Um, I'm so sorry. That's that's that is heartbreaking. And um, yeah, I, I, this is this is where we are. You know, this is where we are. And you've been a campus minister for just a couple of years. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Pretty much nothing you haven't seen. I'm really sorry about that. Um, so thirty. And hey, for everybody who's out there, if you're looking for, a, I'll I'll just. Put, put this out there. I mean, Steve's really a very capable um, campus minister. So if your campus is looking for somebody dynamic, Steve's your guy. <laughs> so, um, so you've been, you've been, you've been collecting this data for a long time. Where do you typically collect it? Is it all in Google sheets? Is it just simply Excel or using something more sophisticated than that? Um, we use a pro we use access. And so access allows us to, um, the way we've set it up to load in participation and then also to load in just demographic data so we can go and grab that easy. I'm, I know there's other programs, but we haven't found anything that works, but that program also allows us to look at, you know, when people enter, where do they go after they enter? You know, like they may enter because of an immersion trip. Do they go to a retreat? Do they go to a small group? So I've tried to help us to look at like, where's the patterns that are emerging? You know, we say that lots of people come because of this retreat. Is that actually true? Do the numbers bear that out or is it just kind of our sense of things? Um, so, you know, it's Microsoft access. Mm -hmm. Super helpful. Yeah. I mean, it's this idea, it's not so much data driven, but data informed. And I think a lot of times we, we take little bits of data and we broadcast those as if that's everybody, you know? So for example, I'm looking at Father Kevin Feeney from, from Northwestern. Father Kevin might give what he thinks is an amazing homily on a Sunday, and uh, maybe he won't hear anything, you know, no feedback, just crickets. Or maybe he'll, he'll tell a joke and two people will laugh, and afterwards he'll say, they loved it, that was a great joke. Well, two out of 200 is not exactly an overwhelming number, but sometimes we do that, right? Or we have a great retreat and we think it's amazing, but then we look at the data and we say, oh my gosh, actually we're down from last year, or we're looking at a three-year trend where we might be up or we might be down, et cetera, or it might just be flat. Um, so that's really interesting. Okay, thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, let's
let's, let's go to another campus that, that's uh, a little bit bigger. Lisa Litwin, can I put you on the spot here and uh, just say a little bit about Catholic Terps and uh, what kinds of data would you typically be looking at and how has that changed for you guys since uh, this semester began? Sure. So I actually, I think was a podcast you did with maybe Father Mike that really got us like, okay, we got to make time to track numbers. So, I mean, we've been collecting registrations for a number of years and my coworkers, Matt and Anne are on this call as well. So tracking number of students registered, um, people who come to mass every weekend, come on retreats, small groups, um, a couple of years where we've set aside the time, we've also tracked like who came to orientation, who came then on freshman retreat, who made it from there into Bible study. And that told us some really cool stories about kind of like you were saying, what, what actually works and what takes someone from kind of like a passive engagement into wow, they're really deeply integrated into the community. Lisa, how would you at the end of the year kind of process those measurements and then how would you communicate it out to the community and let me just say before you answer that um another welcome as we did last week to our our future campus ministers so joanne shull thank you for bringing the newest campus minister to office hours <laughs> your little one's adorable we love love seeing kids uh, all right, sorry, ADD. Lisa, back to you. So how would you typically process the data and the things you measure with your team? And then how do you communicate it out to the community? So I think we spend some time, like usually a meeting or two to kind of look at it all in one place and get it all into one Excel sheet and see what story it tells us. And then we typically, typically would take that and put it into our summer newsletter that my coworker Ann works on. And so obviously it's kind of boring to just like put together pages with numbers, but it's figuring out how to tell the story, but include the numbers so that the impact is shown, you know, alongside some data. Yeah, I like that. And I, I would imagine a lot of campuses kind of similar. Um, Okay, so what would you do if the data wasn't what you were looking for? Do you know what I mean? I'm sure, I mean, every year isn't roses for everything we're measuring, but would you just gloss over that? Or would you just say, okay, look, here's the story we're going to tell. Not everything supports it, but we're going to highlight the things that do. I think, I'm trying to think of an example of that. I think we would be honest about what the data tells us, but turn it into an opportunity to show here's what we're going to focus on next year. or Here's something new that we're going to try based on what this has told us. So like, here's some goals we're continuing because look, the data showed that this works. And here's some new goals that we're seeing because we're, you know, the data is showing us something different. So like our social media, uh, has as a story about that like everyone used to be on facebook now nobody is how do we change that okay now we have more social media interns on instagram and our followers are up there and so i guess that's an example of you know where oh the numbers went down but here's where people are and the data tells us that and we can craft the story and goals mm -hmm. around it okay you know numbers tell many stories right and uh you can you can usually tell when an organization hasn't exactly met their their goals um but you have to be a discerning kind of person in that um okay let's open i'm i just want to see is father eric nielsen on from wisconsin father eric i don't know if i see you are you here Okay, not yet. <laughs> uh, I think he's going to be because I wanted to get the perspective from a, a Wisconsin school. Um, and if you want to raise your hand to ask a particular question, I think you can do that somewhere at the bottom of the screen um, somehow. So, um, okay, let's, I want to invite everybody in the chat, if you would, um, what's something new that you plan on or you're already measuring this semester? And I've got a couple of slides that I want to uh, suggest, but before we do that, um, and invite you to put into the chat there, what's something new that you're already measuring this semester or you plan on it? And 
while you're doing that. Joanne, I see your hand is up. Go ahead. Let's see, Joanne Shell, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, I don't think so. Maybe she pressed a button. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's that's fine. Okay, this is really great. All right, let's take a look here. So social media engagement, definitely something uh, to measure. I mean, it's is it as good as real face-to-face -face communication? No, but it is at least measurable. Online outreach that we've tried. Ministry outreach to commuters. That's really, really interesting. Jose, could you take yourself off mute? I just want to put you on the spot here a little bit. Jose Matos from St. Mary's in San Antonio. Talk a little bit about ministry outreach to commuters and how you're able to measure that. Uh, thank you. Um, so one of the things is that I've been doing the ministry for residents, like residence hall ministry for a couple of years. And that's about 1,500 of our students. Um, but then we have 2,300 of our students who are commuters. And, you know, always in the online surveys and everywhere, they came up as uh, low engagement or they just come for classes and then they have to leave and do something else. So that led us to a two-year reflection on what to do. And honestly, uh, we just had to divert some resources from residence hall ministry. So instead of having 10 peer ministers for all the residence halls, I realigned two peer ministers for commuters. And next year, we're gonna have four peer ministers for commuters. Um, and then realigning scheduling, instead of being heavy in the evenings for uh, events, uh, then let's do two, two types of events, one uh, at lunch, uh, around lunch, and then other events uh, in the early evening, five, 5.30ish, um, and a lot of prayer experiences. A lot of commuters are asking for prayer experiences. And we did like a round of car blessings. Um, so we did car blessings in August and in January, way before the virus. So I think that was kind of foretelling what's coming because that's what we did in the parking lot, just, you know, blessing the, the cars with the, with the uh, handbook of uh, Christian ritual. So I, I think those are initiatives uh, to get the students in, interested in what we do, but we also have to meet them where they are. And that has been the most uh, pressing need. And looking into August and the fall, uh, we already know that we're going to go down in residence halls uh, attendance. So we have to literally beef up our commuter outreach. Mm, interesting. Thanks for that. Let's see. Abby says just we're, we're measuring work hours, like how we're spending our time. Um, I use an app called Toggle, T-O-G-G-L. It's totally free. And uh, I use that to, to measure my own time. And it's very, very helpful because at the end of the week, it gives you a report. And you see, oh, my goodness, I spent this many hours on this. and very helpful, but that's the kind of thing that if you're trying to tell a story at the end of this year, you could say, we increased our direct evangelization efforts by 20% and we can, we can prove it. Something like that. Um, okay. Interesting. <laughs> We're trying to measure vocations. That's, that's not an easy thing perhaps to measure, but, but valuable. Uh, let's see. Kentucky number of graduates on a Friday zoom. Okay. That's really good. Yeah. I like that. Okay, interesting. All right, so again, these are kind of new things that we're measuring. So I think what I'd like to do, uh, the app was called Toggle, T-O-G-G-L. It's totally free. I want to share my screen one last time. Okay, and you can see this, I hope. All 
Okay, great. You can see this. Just give me a thumbs up if you can see this screen says office hours, three ways to measure. Yes, okay. So I would suggest kind of a three-step process here based on many of the things that we've just been saying. Step one is list what you had been measuring and step two, we'll go through these again. Step two would be identify new things to measure. So this, and, and just going back to step one, the idea is, is simply that the, it's very important to say, what, what are we actually tracking? You know, what's the data that actually matters? And because we, we only have a certain number of hours in a day. And then how has that all changed? That's really step two. You know, so this could be measuring Zoom attendance at anything, you know, uh, watch party attendance, new followers on anything. Some of you mentioned, you know, social media engagement, new followers, uh, comments per week, comments per event, video views, podcast listens, downloads, Bible study attendance, online giving. I heard from, from several people who said, believe it or not, online giving is up among their student population. Not like it's going to be huge numbers, but. That's kind of interesting. You can certainly measure that. Uh, number of, of spiritual direction appointments. That's really interesting, right? Uh, accompaniment conversations, and that's a very general term, but you know, people who are seeking, they're searching, they're really asking probing questions. Um, gospel conversations, sometimes they're called. Referrals to counseling. Um, why is that important? Uh, I was on with the head of counseling from the University of San Diego yesterday. It's important because we knew, we knew our students were in pretty rough shape from a mental health perspective before this. So it's pretty normal for them to be emerging from this, not exactly in better shape, okay? But these are the kinds of things for donors in particular or for our supervisors, whomever that might be, we wanna be able to say, we're in touch with our students and they're really struggling. Uh, let's see. Okay. And then step three, I would suggest is just to communicate success. Okay. So when we, we say success, we may also mean, I feel like I've gone dark here. We may mean progress. And yeah, I wanted to share this with you. Progress is, is, is really fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, here we go. Uh, so I, I got this email from Ascension Press uh, just in the last couple of days. Maybe you got this as well. And this was a letter, an email from their CEO, Matt Pinto, uh, talking about, I think the subject was, yeah, if you love our free content, please read this letter. And they did, really, this is a model for what each of us can do. They asked for help, but they told a story of all that they have done to respond to COVID-19. And I would imagine every one of our campuses could do the exact same thing, whether it's just for your impact report at the end of the year, or if it's for a spring appeal right now. And look at the way that they did it. They put bullet items, they put things in bold, and if I just do the quick kind of zoom in, I see 110 live programs, online celebration of mass, 270,000 people watch mass on Easter Sunday, uh, faith formation programs virtually, 50,000 comments and prayer requests. I haven't been following Ascension very carefully, but that sounds pretty impressive just with the 15 second check, you know, and I would imagine that your constituents would be really impressed with the work that you've been doing as well. But again, that presumes that we're tracking these things. So how do you tell the story at the end of the year? Some of you have already mentioned it. It's maybe through your impact report at the end of the year. Uh, I recommend canva.com. It's either free or very modest fee, but it's, it's just great. There's nothing to code. There's nothing to program pre-designed templates, so easy. Upsharing, once you have that, that, that either letter or that report, that means share your success and your progress with your supervisors, who's, whoever that might be. Job security is a reality for many of us, and so sharing your progress up the pipeline is very, very important. How about downsharing? In other words, sharing your success with students, whether they're actively engaged with your ministry or not, sharing it down, peer sharing. Um, I got a, a text last night from a director and he had just done a new video. He was really proud of himself and he wanted me to see it. 
And it was great. It was fantastic. Of course, I did ask myself, why is he sharing this with me? You know, is there like a, a subliminal message in that or something? But the point was, he was peer sharing. And that's something that we all, I think it's a good, good thing for all of us to do. Student sharing. And then, of course, put it online, send it out in email, put it in, in video, uh, talk about it on YouTube, embed it in your email footer. Remember that ministry promotion is good stewardship. Uh, I, I really mean that. And I know that that's really hard for a lot of us, just this idea of, of kind of bragging about ourselves. We're not very good at it in ministry, but it's really stewardship. You know, I, I, I've told the story many times of a major campus on the East Coast who had a new bishop come in who was a good bishop. And he immediately slashed their budget 20% without any conversation. Now, two years later, it's been restored and things are, are better. Um, but... I think the bigger point is just that if we're constantly telling our story and measuring progress and measuring success, um, I think it, we're less likely to have our budget slashed by 20%. Of course, we're in a pandemic now, but everything's changed. Um, so those are just some suggestions. Uh, let's open up the lines. And uh, Diane says, could you repeat what the slide of step one was? Step one is just inventory what you had been measuring. Step two is think of the new things that are just good common sense to be measuring now. And if you feel like I can't do that, trust me, just take 30 minutes, write down everything you can right now. You're probably able to measure more than you think. And then the third step is tell that story. And it doesn't have to be a perfect story. It just has to be one that you really believe in. Uh, it's like going for a job interview. If you believe your truth, then you're more likely to get that job. Okay, let's open up the lines and uh, if you wanna raise your hand or if you wanna just take yourself off mic and tell us where you're from and uh, what question would you like to bring to the group or perhaps uh, best practice you'd like to share with everybody. Okay, Haley says, how do other schools keep their diocesan offices in the loop? That's a really good question. Haley, do you wanna just take yourself off mute there and just say a little bit more, what do you mean? Sure. Um, I'm the campus ministry director at the University of Wisconsin Platteville. And one of the things that we're hoping to do, we just got a new bishop in the Diocese of Madison a couple of years ago. And would love to be able to, um, as we're trying to grow our ministry, to be able to be in greater conversation with our bishop, with our diocese about what it is that we're doing to be able to be highly and um, more able to communicate that success. So we'd love to hear what other campuses are doing to kind of be in contact with their bishop or with their uh, larger diocesan offices? That's a really good question. You know, that's, that's, I don't know if that's peer sharing or up sharing, but that's really valuable. I know I have for CCMA, I have a, a, a course, a list of our benefactors, but I also have a, a ministry outreach list. And these are like executive directors from other organizations, or these are university presidents, or just like key people that I want to foster that relationship with. And I probably every two, every two months, uh, will send just a little email out to them. And they don't know that I'm probably copying and pasting the body of that email. But at least I know that I'm in touch with them six times a year. And um, I think that seems to help. Who wants to chime in on, on Haley's question here in terms of how are you keeping your diocese in the loop, especially your diocesan director? Okay, let's see here if I can do this correctly. Can I go? Yes, please, go ahead. So uh, in San Antonio, uh, we, we do have a standing bi-monthly meeting of campus ministers is called the intercollegiate campus ministry uh, group. And we do um, organize four events per year. And that's the excuse to get together and make sure that the campus ministry director of the Archdiocese is, is, is well known about what we do. But we do have an intercollegiate confirmation mass in February that all our faith formation programs share. Uh, and then um, commissioning mass in September and then a social and an awards banquet, well, an awards celebration at the end. But that actually is very simple, but it has been very helpful for us. Jose, um, some people say they send monthly reports to their diocesan director. I'd say if you're gonna do that, keep it really brief. 
you know, and if you can make it nice looking and add photos, that's probably a good thing. Again, it's, it's advertising, you know, even for your bosses, there's a little bit of advertising there. Anybody else you want to chime in? How do you keep your diocesan director or your diocese posted as to what you're doing? Am I on? Yes, please, Father Jim, go ahead. I'm Jim Sheen from the South Bronx. Um, I get a kick out of diocesan reports because I've been in this ministry for 20 years and there's about three white people on the whole campus. So I always say, along with Pope Francis, you know, we've had to reach the margins and we're doing it. And one holy supervisor um, was very angry that I kept on referring to black and Latinos. And the one presently involved is very happy for that. Um, I keep it on numbers. I never got any feedback from it formally. They're afraid to put stuff in print. Um, mm. So I, I find it to be, um, I have no idea where those reports go. And I think it's just a way of covering it. And once a year they get together and they say, should we cut it any further? Commuter colleges and city university. Mm. And then we laugh about it. I said, but yeah, I've sent that into you. Oh yeah, you're very conscientious. Mm. Um, I do think the ethnic issue is very key. And so many church agencies that are involved in funding are looking for traditional groups coming in, i.e. vocations. And that historically has been a white man's situation. And, you know, we aren't supposed to say that, but it's evident by the statistics that that's what's happening. Um, so I think the challenge to us as campus ministers is, do we show the future of the church? With all respect to traditions, which are sacred, are we really about the future and the Holy Spirit? Thanks, Father Jim. You know, one thing that's not a bad idea, and it takes a little bit of courage, is to ask whomever is your supervisor, are these reports helpful? <laughs> you, know, you want them shorter? You want them longer? How about every other month? You know, and, uh, and I'm eating my own dog food. I mean, I, I've said that to the CCMA board, like, look, you'll save me three hours. I, I, if you don't want me to do the report, I'm totally cool with that. You know, but if there's some value, I'm happy to keep doing it. So sometimes just asking. Um, somebody put in the chat, this is really interesting. This is very strategic. Uh, we identify key leaders within our diocese and then we make sure to keep them in the loop. That is very strategic there, you know, because not all pastors are as influential as others. Not all bishops are as influential as others. And it is, it is okay, you know, to have kind of, look, this is my VIP list. And I'm going to make sure that I'm always telling the story, a little snapshot, a little something. Okay. I'm just trying to look at some other things here that are really helpful. Uh, Courtney says, we usually meet three times a year, all the campus ministers. We do have some monthly reports with just three questions. What's going well? What are you struggling with? What are your touch points with students? Make sense? Mike? Yes. It's Joanne Petrowski. Um, hey, Joanne. It, I think that the Diocese of Cleveland is unique in that um, I'm the assistant director for Newman Campus Ministry and six ministers serving on seven campuses report directly to me. And I have a priest who's my director. So I handle all the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, but we, uh, and they're spread all over the diocese. We have 11 counties. Um, so up until we started sheltering in place, we would meet once a month for an hour and a half, like at 1030 to noon. And then we treat them to like we'd eat a meal together. And at that meeting, there was always a time for everybody to give a campus update. Um, the ministers for the first time this year under me uh, put together their own uh, set of goals for the year. So that's how they're being measured is how, did they meet the goals they set for themselves? There was a midpoint check-in so they could tell me if they needed to be tweaked or you know something happened and they're not gonna like this, like being at home, they're not gonna be able to do that thing they were gonna do in the spring. Um, so that's kind of how we do it. And we have three Catholic campuses that are in our diocese and we try to meet with them at least once a semester. And I loop them in on things that we're doing. Uh, they're in my distribution list and they're all friends of mine because I used to be on one of those campuses. So um, that's kind of how, it's kind of easy for my people to report. 
And then from there, uh, whoever's asking for it, it's a, I give it to my boss. He's got it for whoever wants it. Um, so I don't know if that's, that's helpful. I, I think it's really helpful, Julian. Thanks. So you were a peer who's become a boss. That's always an interesting uh, <laughs> jump. But you know what? Your peers know you're there for them. And so they're more likely to give you an honest report. Uh, yeah. I, worked in, I worked in schools for many years and the superintendent would ask for the school calendar and many principals would give him or her the official school calendar. And then they'd have a whole separate calendar that they would actually use with their faculty. <laughs> so hopefully you're getting the honest one. Um, I put a question in, in the chat in terms of uh, your impact report or your annual report. How do you share that? Um, Joanne Schull from Mizzou uh, did a, it's on YouTube, I'm sure, Joanne, right? Uh, did a, a YouTube webinar a couple of, last year, year before on the importance of an end of year impact report or annual report, uh, just because it's the telling of the story. It's in print. Um, and I'd just be curious, we use next day flyers. Also in Canva, a lot of people are using Canva. Um, if you can't do mailing right now, which is where a lot of us are, you still have email um, and you still have a website and you still have the ability to, to do that. You could also take certain stories within your impact report and turn those into blog posts or even social media posts. So you don't need to recreate the wheel. You can just extract certain things out of that. That's not a bad um, idea. I would also say for your, your impact report or your annual report, it doesn't have to be long, you know, four pages, six pages, eight pages. You know, it doesn't have to be long. Um, and always give it to somebody who's kind of objective. You know, um, there's this story from, from years ago uh, of a Midwestern university, and they took this promotional uh, photo of students uh, cheering at a football game, and they realized that all the students were Caucasian. So they said, no problem, we can take care of that. So they photoshopped in an African-American male. And uh, that didn't go over well, as you can imagine. You know, but I think the bigger perspective is you need objective eyes. You know, I mean, are you showing priests and collars? Are you showing young people smiling? Are you showing sacramental photography? Are you quoting popes? Uh, are you quoting saints? You know, I mean, it, it's got to be honest, right? But also just you want an, an objective set of eyes to say, hmm, I noticed that we, I don't know, you know, it feels like this or like that. Okay, let's see. Okay, Matt says, it would be really cool if we could see other campuses impact report via PDF on the CCMA website. Uh, we could borrow, tweak, or get inspired by them. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that, Matt. Also, any of you, if you want to uh, do a quick search on your own websites and uh, put it on to the chat right now, you're more than welcome to. And if any of you want to send to me uh, your impact reports, I'd be more than happy to, to send them out. Um, some of you said, we make sure we invite our bishop regularly to campus. Really smart, you know, and even if your bishop can't get there or hasn't been there, ask him for a quote, a one-liner, a little something, you know, that you could include in your impact report. Uh, and just be specific, be brief, you know, but that's another way of just kind of telling the story because and he'll always know you're there and uh, your ministry matters. Let's see. Hey, Kevin Steele, can you take yourself off mute there? And um, yeah. I just want to ask you to talk about, uh, I know you guys have in, you've really uh, invested a lot in development and telling the story at the University of Kentucky. Talk a little bit about what does that look like for you guys at the end of your academic year? Okay. Hello, everybody. Kevin Steele. Great to be with you. Great to see everybody. Uh, yeah. So, I've got a little of both. I'm full-time Catholic campus minister, but I've been asked for the last couple years to uh, reach out to alumni to help build up a support group there. So I'm, I've got my foot in both sides. I mean, it's all ministry, but I'm, I'm, I'm learning a new skill with the raising support. But at this point, yeah, we do a, you know, we've, we do a, <laughs> well, now it's probably, you know, a committee, you know, we have a, a leadership council of, you know, impact people to help our fundraising. We were right in the middle of a capital campaign this semester to build onto our place, but, uh, and that's still, you know, that that's in process like everything else. But at this point of the semester, we're just, 
uh, inviting our supporters to know what we're doing to honor the seniors virtually. Uh, I just put in there the, the bishop. Usually, we always invite the bishop to preside at our baccalaureate mass, which would have been last Sunday at five. It's the Sunday mass. I mean, the, the one Sunday mass that has the most students. We're a parish, a university parish. And so he does. He, he really likes it. He comes John Stowe, Bishop John Stowe, Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, so that got canceled. You know, we, we don't have mass now. But he did uh, agree to make a message. So just this morning, he sent me a link. Hey, send this out to all the, all the places. And so we'll send that out as to, to our to our benefactors also like you know here's what we're doing and we're doing a live stream mass sunday that we do now like a lot of us do but it's a special a blessing for mothers and a blessing for graduates and so we'll invite benefactors to especially know that that mass is going on uh live streamed you know and and then we'll read a list of those graduates also and the graduates include Med students, dental, pharmacy, undergrads, professional. I mean, we'll see. I'm getting the, I, I don't want it to be more work for the pastor, who's also a medical doctor, Steve Roberts. So I said, look, uh, I'll come in and read the list. He goes, no, don't just give me the list. Uh, give me the story. You know, college of medicine. Next year, I'm going to residency in Cleveland Clinic. You know, and I, so he goes, this puts meat on the names of these people. So I was expecting to have to kind of do a lot of that myself virtually or email. Uh, so that's just sort of telling, keep telling the story, I guess. I think that's, I always think that's what Disney World's good at. <laughs> and, and we got to get better at doing that too. Thanks, Kevin. No, it's super helpful. Um... I think one of the things is that, that I'm hearing as well is where do I capture the data? And I'm not sure it matters where. I think it's just have one place and then keep using it. Excel is not very pretty to look at, but boy, is it reliable, you know, or Google Sheets or eTapestry or whatever you're using, Bloomerang, whatever. Um, but I know several very sophisticated uh, campus ministries in the country, they just use Excel. You know, uh, but they make sure then on their Google Calendar or whatever they use for calendaring, every two months they have an appointment where they're looking at the data or they're inserting the data. So it's not just something that that never gets touched. Um, great. Yeah, and I see some. We're using Google Docs, eTapestry. Um, if you're able to take screenshots of some of your Zoom meetings. I realize there, there can be some age things there or permissions and all that, but let's say it's your staff meeting. You know, you might say, look, we're, I'm just gonna take a screen grab of our staff meeting or our peer ministry meeting. Keep that, keep that for your, your impact report, your annual report, your newsletter, whatever it might be. Because a lot of times benefactors, um, they might not be as much online as you and I are. And uh, I was meeting with a benefactor November, December, and we were asking for support for some of the things that CCMA is doing. We talked about a podcast and you would have thought that a podcast was like just invented. You know, it was like Bitcoin. He was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. A podcast. That's, that's incredible. You know, and I'm thinking they've been around for like 15 years, but to people out there outside of campus ministry land, um, a little visual, a screen grab, Zoom, you know, I mean, these things make a statement that you're cutting edge and that you're, you're really in with the program. Okay, um, I think we're going to wrap things up. If, unless there's any final questions here, um, these are so helpful. And um, again, I, I encourage you to, to share any of your impact reports that you want to. And if you're just like, I don't even know where to start, um, please reach out to me, email me, and I'll point you to people around the country who are much better at this than I am, and they can help you, okay? Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Regina put a question out there. I didn't see it, Regina. What is your question?
Going once, going twice, Regina? Sold, okay, so very good. Sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. I was Go ahead. Thinking, but I end up typing by mistake to somebody. Anyway, my question was, um, how do people make the connection between Canvas Ministry data and retention numbers or retention impact? Hmm. That's a really good question. Anybody want to take a stab at that? I yeah. haven't. I uh, sent her a little message, but when I was at Ursuline, every department was responsible for reporting on what they were doing for retention. Well, one of the things that comes out of my, what came out of my area was community service, and that is across the board on any campus, no matter what office runs it, a measure for retention. And so I just asked the question specifically. At the end of the year, I contacted every student that participated in any community service, and I asked the question directly. One of the reasons I stay at Ursuline is because of the community service opportunities, yes or no. Um, and you know, 85% came back with, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I stay. So um, it's not, it's, it's okay to ask the question specifically, not have to divine an answer, just um, figure out a way, even at the end of every community service project that you do, if you wanna do a quick half sheet, what'd you learn about yourself doing this? What'd you learn about the agency you were at? And then, you know, ask the question. Is it things like this that keep me at whatever college? And then you have that one thing that you can report uh, to whoever, yeah, this is how, what I'm doing to impact retention. Does that help? I think that helps. Regina, is that helpful? Uh, yes. Um, we don't, we have another office on campus that does community service. Uh, community mm -hmm. service is one of those things you know, can sort of ask those direct questions, but mm -hmm. you know, for instance, I mean, I assume that going to mass regularly is a huge retention thing, but how do you get that? How do you get that out of students? You know, uh, I, I can see you could ask that question on retreats, Bible study, but mm -hmm. you know, the largest attendance we have is at liturgy, and then sort of try to figure out how to make a case for that kind of connection. But maybe it just can't be done. I don't know. You you can do an end of the year quick survey about specifically that. You know, the opportunities to worship on campus is mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I stay. Yes or no? Yeah. We, yeah. Um, okay. yeah. Just to be as specific as possible of what you're trying to get and, and get them to answer the question on how it relates to, to retention. Yeah, I think anytime you can give, whether you're at a Catholic college, a state school, a private school, community college, anytime you can give the admissions department a talking point for their tour, mm -hmm. that's good. Even if you're at a state school, a good state school wants a good Jewish center, Muslim center, Catholic center, and certainly at a Catholic college, you know, while many Catholic colleges don't do a great job in terms of promoting the chapels and campus ministry departments, et cetera, they all deep down want good talking points. Um, and if it's retention or community service or something like that, that can be valuable. And you could even ask them, you know, build a good rapport with your admissions uh, director and just say, what, what would be helpful? You know, what's the kind of stuff you guys are looking for? Because we have a lot of data. All right. Um, let's put a ribbon on it. Great conversation today. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I feel like we could keep going and going. And um, thank you to all of you who filled out the poll. I think we had 96% of you filled out the poll in terms of continuing office hours after this section is done. This will be, next week will be our eighth office hour. That's kind of amazing. Uh, you guys have made that happen. So give yourself a good pat on the back because uh, it's been really fun to be together. Also, let me just remind you to uh, please consider and sign up for the Online Ministry Summit. It's going to be awesome. It really is. Uh, I wouldn't promote it if I didn't believe it. And so that's over at the CCMA website under resources. Uh, it's going to be the evening of May 26th and then a good chunk of the day on May 27th. So it's gonna be really excellent. Next week, just a reminder, we're back at office hours, 3 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday. We're gonna be talking about professional certification. And if you're thinking, I don't need that, you know, my, my diocese doesn't value it. You know, we heard from Steve earlier, all of us, you know, per, as professionals, we need as sturdy a foundation as we possibly can have. And uh, I really believe certification can be one of those pieces, one of those planks in a very sturdy 
um, infrastructure around us. So anyways, we'll be talking about that. I think it's gonna be really good. If you know Angel and Courtney, they're super fun. And uh, so it's gonna be good. With that said, let's close with prayer and then we'll see everybody next week. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end, amen. Mary, mother of the church, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God bless you guys. You hang in there. Keep doing your good work. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Take care. Most welcome. Anytime. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Peace.